welcome to the session. Please feel uh, welcome to uh, participate, ask questions, bring your experiences. Uh, this session is actually to honor what we in, in, in our capacities as instructional designers have seen from your teaching practice. So, which yeah, brings us to our next slide. Yes. <laughs> So I wanted to uh, briefly talk about um, great teaching and, and my experience as a yoga student. I, I have been very lucky to have two amazing mentors in, in my life. Um, one of them may be sitting here, as I said before. And my other mentor is um, the yoga instructor that I have been working under and with for about six or seven years. She was also the person I took my yoga training with. So I have developed a very, very close relationship with her, have learned a lot from her. Um, but then uh, I wanted to, to, talk about, to talk about this one time when I, was, I went to her class and she wasn't there, we had a sub. And the sub had a very different style and um, I just, you know, I paid attention and, and, and just noticed that she was very different. And then because I was curious, I went to another of her classes and then another of her classes. And I realized that what I couldn't put my finger on was that she was very attentive. She was very responsive to the class. Uh, and she was even asking questions which is not really the norm in a yoga class. And so this is where this quote comes from because I really, and we, right, Tanya and Judy, we yes. know great teaching when we see it. Yep, definitely. So um, on the mat, on, on this online environment, and, and particularly in, in, in our jobs, in our work with you. Definitely. Um, and I'll try to provide examples as we go through like of, you know, different things I've seen with working with different instru uh, instructors, subject matter experts. Um, so I'll go ahead and I'll move on to our next slide, which is going to be our guiding thought for today. Mm -hmm. So are we really speaking to our students? So as, as we move through the slides, um, we would like you to, to continue to keep thinking about this question. Um, this is going to be our common thread, our, our, the glue that brings together everything that we're saying, including the yoga practice, and at the end, your takeaways. So we normally start with objectives, but in this class, we were very intentional about um, just offering this guiding thought and asking you to be um, attentive and mindful of how these you know, um, it's weaved into what we're going to be doing later. So one of the um, yoga principles that we're going to talk about is skillful action. Um, and so how we're going to kind of go through this uh, session is uh, Mary will talk about, you know, the yoga side, and then I'm going to try to see how this applies to, you know, an online or even a face-to-face -face course. So the first principle that we wanted to talk about is this idea of skillful action. And uh, I heard this in my readings in yoga, I heard this next quote that will show you. And uh, every time I heard that, that quote or had a thought, I, I, I thought this is really what learning is about. Right? So let me put on my glasses. <laughs> so what we're doing with our students is, is trying to provoke this shift in understanding that makes the action wise. In yoga, this is about the wise action is basically uh, the action that brings the most benef benefit to all. And of course, in, in, in the yoga principle, the action that either stops or prevents more suffering. So it's this whole idea about energizing, using your action to energize. 
and it relates to what we do as educators and, and that's something that Tanya will translate later on, uh, but it relates to our energy and actions that we do to challenge and uh, allow the intellect of our students to grow. So expanding and challenging the, inter the intellect of our students and also this idea of skill development. So that's why we call it skillful action, action that results in us providing the means for our students to develop their skills. Another principle that this applies to is this idea that yoga today is something that we practice in our everyday life. It's not something that we, I don't think we have the luxury of going into a cave and retiring from the world, withdrawing from the world, but we actually do it here and now. And we want these to be transferred in, into real life experiences from our students. So one thing that um, when you were just speaking that kind of sparked a uh, thought in my mind was the ending of suffering, right? Um, and so one of the things that I wanna bring up is active learning. So how can this skillful action translate into academic mm -hmm. courses? So have you ever sat through a lecture that you're basically falling asleep and you're just <laughs> suffering through it the whole time. And so one way to end this, you know, student suffering of, you know, really long lectures and maybe getting a little boring and this and that is to try to put in some active learning into your courses, um, you know, as well as um, interweaving some real life activities and learning for real life jobs. And so what do we mean about that? What is active learning exactly? Active learning is an approach to instruction that actively engages your students through the material, but through discussions and problem solving and case studies rather than just lectures. Um, it's kind of putting the responsibility on the learner to learn instead of you just uh, divulging all the information to them. Um, a couple of, you know, uh, active learning strategies that can be used in the classroom. Well, actually, no, that's a question that I want to ask you first. So does anybody have um, any active learning strategies that they use in their classroom that they would like to share with the rest of us? Jennifer says breakout sessions are a, a, uh, are a, a, a good way of doing some active learning. And it definitely is because that's a sharing time. That's a time that students can say, well, I tr let's do this or let's do that. And how will it, how do we think it'll work out? Uh, asking students to provide examples during breakout sessions with each other. Exactly. Because that's how we learn. We take what we know and then we translate it into what we feel like is going to uh, is going to come out of that knowing. Right, definitely. Those are all great examples. Um, and so, yeah, so those were ones that I was going to talk about. So there's Think, Pair, Share, there's Jigsaw, and there's Muddiest Point. So Jigsaw was one of the ones that I was just talking about. Um, and basically, it's, you know, basically dividing the content uh, into you know, the different people in your class, or maybe you're gonna break them up in groups. Um, and uh, then you just have the students, how you want them research it and how they're gonna present it to the rest of the group. So basically everybody has a piece of their teaching to the rest of um, their colleagues. Then there's also a muddiest point. So have your students maybe in a discussion board or a survey, um, let you know what was the most a difficult part for them to explain in maybe a lecture or a part of, you know, the course that you're teaching. Um, and then the think pair share, which is what um, some of the examples that were given by uh, our visitors today, um, basically splitting up students into groups, having them, well, first think about it, then splitting them into groups, um, and then sharing with the rest of the class, you know, what it was that um, it was that you were asking them to do, right? So whatever the activity was. 
Uh, so yeah, yeah, those were great. Yeah, Professor Grunfeld has shared that uh, he uses Flip, which he learned from our PD sessions. Thank you for that. <laughs> that the students record and share and comment within the discussion tab, and that they love the activities, and they do because that's a that's a rate of actually interacting with each other, not necessarily in real time, but in interacting completely with the, the voice, the video, and the comments. Thank yes, you. Yes, that's Professor. beautiful for online. Yeah, because a lot of these, you know, um, strategies can be used online and in person. Sometimes, you know, instructors have the misconception that it could only be in person, but we have a lot of tips for how to move these things online. So if you ever need help, you know, reach out to us and we could definitely help you with that. We have another um, comment um, from Veronica. Sorry, Tanya. I, I just wanted to make sure to read it. She said simulations in group projects. Um, definitely. Um, and, and Tanya has in there uh, an image where students were learning how to stop a blood bleeding. <laughs> blood mm -hmm. bleeding. Stop yeah. bleeding. And uh, I also wanted to talk about the going back to the idea of developing skills in our students, the, the 21st century skills that um, are practiced in the classroom, which is the safe environment we provide for our students. For example, effective communication, uh, which is part of group work, uh, a big part of it, conflict resolution, another big part of group work, um, teamwork, you know, everything we were saying, saying before, um, and critical thinking. So all of these are pieces and strategies that we incorporate as we are being um, very intentional about the actions we take to develop skills in our students. And this is a good segue to our next one. Right, but before we move on, I do wanna also uh, bring up that it's, you know, we wanna do the active learning part of it, but then we also want to add in authentic assessment, right? So we wanna have, you know, assessments that are bringing, you know, real, real world problems into the classroom, right? So for example, if you were, uh, a social work instructor and you wanted to bring in some type of a real world ex example, you could talk about uh, hurricanes, right? So we just had two major hurricanes. There was a lot of devastation. Um, maybe one of your projects or assessments could be, you know, putting together like a resource guide for um, how people could get help during these times or um, if it was a biology or a virology course, you could talk about COVID-19. Uh, um, and then also going back to the hurricane situation, um, if it's like a nursing uh, class, you can maybe have like an um, assignment where the students are putting together like a plan of care. How, how can we get in there and help as many people as possible and kind of like triage what we need to do? Um, so those are all really good ones. And actually, uh, recently I was working with an instructor who... I thought was really cool uh, what she had in her course, and it was um, an exercise science course. And she had the students basically do like a dream proposal. So basically figure out uh, what um, what they wanted to have like a exercise. So like, for example, Mary. So if it was Mary, for example, maybe she would want to have like a yoga studio, right? And so they would have to come up with how they would plan the yoga studio, what would go into it, the furniture, the costs, the whole deal. And I thought that was really a, a great real world type of assessment to do. Mm -hmm. for students. Another type, uh, Tanya, also is within the field of education, our pre-service education students have to do field experience where they actually go into classrooms and observe and participate in what's going on in the classroom. And this is a time where they can see what, what, what is happening, take notes on it, and think about how they can adapt that for their own classrooms coming up. So they're in a real world environment, observing and taking part in what's happening with, with, with students. 
Um, we do have two other points on this slide, which is accessibility and academic integrity and, and copyright. So uh, Mary brought up being intentional. Um, so when we put these on the slide, it was basically when you're, you know, building your course or designing your course, be intentional about your accessibility. You're going to have different uh, learners in your course that might need screen readers. They might have different needs. So maybe think about different ways of putting content into your course, making sure that the content in your course is um, ADA compliant. Um, and then the academic integrity copyright part of it is, you know, basically, you know, role model the um, academic integrity by making sure that the content that you have in your course is copyright compliant, um, fair use, what, whatever um, you think, you know, is, is best in that situation. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. Which Sonia, one, is, one more, one more before, and it ties in with intention is that idea of um, universal design for learning. Yeah. And I'm going to give you another application of that. When you have students who, for example, um, speak another language, and every resource that you provide for your accessibility students, for example, your closed captions, will also benefit um, foreign language students. So um, it's, it's, again, intention put into actions that will bring the most benefit for your students. So moving into intention, um, in yoga, intention refers to, um, it's really the result of, of introspection, self-exploration, in awareness um, in the yoga in the yoga practice this is very much paying attention to what is behind your actions what your motives are what when you say what you say are you being you know are you being truthful to yourself are you being truthful to the person you're speaking with so being aware of um of where you're coming from. And this translates beautiful to the classroom, online or in person, because teaching is an exercise of intention. Everything we put into our classes, every resource we bring, and, and Ju Tanya and Judy will talk about alignment in a minute. Um, so one more thing that we do for, with intention is we create conditions for learning to occur. We bring those activities or experiences that are the most, will create the most growth in our students. So we can achieve that kind of transform transformational experience that will bring us to our highest ideal. So it's all about becoming the person you want to be in the yoga space and in the in the academic educational space i'm going to offer it to tanya judy and the rest of us for for inter, um conversation so how does um intention translate into academic courses well mary already brought up alignment right so students want to know why they're doing something and why it's important to them um, and so one of the best ways to show this to them is through alignment, through writing um, objectives that are student centered, um, as well as under, like that the student can understand it when they read. They know exactly what is being expected of them and what they're going to take away from, you know, either the unit or the course as a whole. Um, another part of that would be a student centered design. Um, so another part mm -hmm. of doing the student-centered design is that it uh, it kind of ties into the self-determination theory of, you know, making the students um, fulfilled in their competence and their connection and autonomy, right, in the course. So they, they feel like um, somebody mentioned giving choices uh, to students, right? So instead of oh, you have to do, you know, a final paper, maybe you could do a video, or maybe you could do um, some other uh, project instead of just, you know, telling them, okay, you have a final paper, this is all, this is your only choice, you better do good on it. Giving kind of a choice to, to your students gives them that 
uh, autonomy and it really helps them, you know, be more um, involved and motivated in your course. And so that kind of goes into what we were talking about, being, you know, checking in, being available for feedback for your students. So throughout the course, you know, maybe have check-ins, um, send out announcements to explain instructions, maybe a little bit more clear if you're noticing that there's issues um, happening there. And then um, another uh, way to be very intentional in your course is to scaffold your assignments, right? So instead of just putting, you know, uh, say you have a concept that's, you know, uh, very involved, instead of just giving that all to your students at once, thinking about how to like chunk it down and give them little parts of it and make sure that they're understanding the first part so that when they get to the next part, they could actually, you know, learn as well and they're not still stuck in that first part. And that that's also going to be in, in our very last slide today. You're going to see why uh, the instructions that you give your students is very important. And um, also, you'll see it in a little later on uh, that as well. I don't want to give anything away, though. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and Professor Diaz has, has indicated something that we advocate a great deal, mid-semester check-in to have them think about where they are, where they want to go, and what we can do to help them get there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. Definitely. OK, so that's going to take us in. <laughs> okay, so we're going to practice this first pose together where, like, uh, like we said before, uh, we invite you to, as we're moving through the pose, uh, to just pay attention to what differences you're noticing, because we're going to do the pose twice. And our back to our guiding thought, to our common thread, what is that you're learning about this experience that tells you about how we communicate with our instructor, with our students? So we are going to, like I said, we're going to do it twice. And um, speaking about refining your instructions, when Tanya, Judy, and myself were practicing this, I was talking about the mat and I had not said anything about the mat because in a yoga class, you always stand on a mat. But again, I wasn't connecting with the context. So we're gonna have an imaginary mat. So it, it's the long edges of your mat will be on your sides. And then you will have the short edges of your, of your mat in front and behind you, all right? If, if, that gives you a sense of space and where you are. So first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna turn towards the right and we're gonna open our, our we're gonna open our feet about three feet away from each other. And then we are gonna keep the back foot at 45 degrees and the front foot we're gonna turn to the computer to the front. Okay, so back foot is 45 degrees, front is facing forward. Bend your front knee, make sure that your knee is not going beyond your ankle. And then internally rotate your back leg, externally rotate your left leg Open the arms, stretch the arms towards the sides and tuck the tailbone in. Okay, let's go back to the front and we're gonna do it the second time. So we're gonna turn towards the right and uh, we're gonna have our feet. If you look at the distance between your waist and your right foot, if you have longer legs, that's going to be different from me. So make it your own, right? So, and then your back foot, it's going to be parallel to the short edge of the mat behind you. The front foot, you're going to pivot so it's parallel to the long edges of your mat. Bending into the front knee, 
Make sure you can see your toes. And then feet are coming together, right? Push, push the mat and bring the feet together. Look at your front thigh. The front thigh is probably hopefully facing up a little bit in the, the back, the back leg, the front of the thigh is turning in a little bit. Uh, open your arms and don't hold your breath. Beautiful. Okay. So <laughs> let's see what your thoughts are. What did you see? What was the main difference between these two poses? Mary, you said something about the legs that I did not understand the not first understand time. The first time. So Sounds for me, it was um, the 45 degree angle. I don't know. I didn't know how to put my foot at a 45 degree angle. And so for the second time around, it was easier when you said, you know, your back leg uh, is going to be the same way as your short side or long side and the front, the short side. So that was easier for me to understand. Veronica said the instructions about rotating 45 degrees was hard. The fact that you had a photo on the screen was helpful. That's very true. <laughs> um, so that's something that in the classroom, you know, in a yoga class, you wouldn't necessarily have, you know, I don't know if maybe it was a really nice studio where you had, you know, a, a TV screen or something where you could put that, or I mean, I guess you could bring in a, a picture and just post it on the wall, but essentially you wouldn't have that. So um, for this example, uh, that's what, what Mary was trying to show is that it's really important to think about, you know, your audience with the instructions as well, because, you know, you might have done something so many times that mm -hmm. it's just like second nature to you. And so you don't, you don't know, you know, all this, like how to explain every step that goes into it until you actually are doing it until you actually see where the miscommunications are happening. And so it's, you know, a good um, practice to kind of go through that yourself, um, maybe before class to see like, did I miss something, you know, what did this really make sense? Maybe, you know, a family member or a friend you could uh, share it with and they could point out areas and where there might be some confusion. And so that could be really helpful, you know, for your students if you're being very intentional in your instructions. So what I was saying about that second time is that um, the 45 degree angle at the, fir the first time was, was more confusing as students could not relate to that and and I was saying that from my own experience when I tell students things about make sure your knee doesn't go beyond your ankle or your toes they really don't know they don't know where the knee is it's it's like uh, Veronica was saying there's a lot to pay attention to so if I simplify my cue into saying make sure you can see your toes uh it it it, it, it is a lot easier to follow um, I have another pose uh, that I I would like to to do with you. Uh, we're, so we're gonna we have six more minutes. Let's go back to standing. I don't have a picture of this one, but hopefully again you will be able to notice the difference and keeping in mind that that common thread, communicating with our students. So on this one, uh, if you want to stand up. Okay, so feet together. You're gonna ground up, you're gonna ground from the feet and you're gonna lift the energy by lifting your kneecaps. On the inhale, lifting the arms, interlacing your fingers, pointing the fingers up. Big inhale and then as you exhale, hips are gonna go in one direction and your upper body, beautiful Judy, is gonna go to another direction. And while you're here, just breathe naturally. Don't hold your breath. And then with your next inhale, come back to the center. Make sure you exhale and relax. On your next inhale, we will go to the other side. So inhale and lift. Exhale, hips are moved to one side. 
and upper body to the other side. Keep, don't hold your breath, keep breathing. Next inhale brings you up. Okay, second time. Feet together, rounding down from your fit, feet, lifting the energy up by lifting your kneecaps. On the inhale, we're gonna lift the arms up. Yeah. <laughs> Interlace the fingers, pointing the index fingers up, and take a big inhale. As you exhale, we're gonna turn, we're gonna uh, move the hips in one direction, open an upper body to the other direction. Feel what's happening with the long side of the body. If I say, I don't wanna say left because it'll be right for you, but the long side of your body, you're getting a full stretch from your fingers all the way to the tip of your toes. Keep breathing nicely. And then your next inhale brings you, brings you back to center. Exhale, relax. Inhale, lift again. Exhale, other side. So again, long, long outer side of the body. You're getting that beautiful stretch um on your right side if you if you're facing forward like me or on your left side if you're doing it the other way your next inhale brings you up exhale the arms down we don't have a lot of time uh so i will invite you to tell me what you noticed that was different well like i told you when we did our practice uh, lifting knees i don't know how to do that yes. <laughs> that yes. was a weird yes. one for that me one. yes yes so what was different the second time over? For me, it was, um, or actually, did you say that both times, actually? When you said to move your hips to one side and then the top of your body to the other side and to really feel the stretch, I felt like that was uh, more detailed than the first time around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Jennifer has indicated that she responds well to hearing what I'm supposed to do rather than uh, and what I'm supposed to feel rather than what I'm supposed to do. Inter interesting. And Veronica liked the interlaced fingers mm -hmm. and index. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. This brings it back to my intention. On the second time, I, I explained this was a, lot, a, a stretch. Um, and, and this goes back to telling our students why so they can connect. The second time, like um, Dr. Atonito is saying, a lot of what we're feeling goes into there, right? Uh, we're connecting at a more personal level. It's not on the abstract. And it's also like that second teacher I said, it's being observant, being uh, acknowledging that your students are in a, in a different place and we meet them where they are. Uh, we want to thank everybody for your participation and and putting yourselves out there and practicing and, and interacting with us. It was really our honor.